a little, another concept, which may or may not be good after all, but I think it will be. Um, okay. There was a gentleman in the 15th century named Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. His mother laid him on him, but he's, he goes by the name of Paracelsus, and he said a very important statement. All things are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. And the only thing that separates a poison from a remedy is the dose. So as a toxicologist, you're going to hear me either talk or ask, answer questions relating to the concept of a dose. In that light, I'd like to also interject a little bit of a some information that I got from a friend of mine who had a friend who, uh, while I was teaching at the University of Texas Medical School, he came down for the big Texas fair. <coughs> so he gets to the fair and uh, he, uh, he wants to find the, uh, the Budweiser kiosk. So he's going to look and he sees two men sitting down looking pretty official. So he walks over to them with the idea of asking if there's beer. Uh, unbeknownst to him, one of the people just hang, hung up the phone and found out that the third judge of the annual chili cook-off was not going to be available and they needed the third uh, judge. So when he asked about where is the beer, the guy said, well, I tell you what, if you'll be a judge in our chili cook-off, then we'll give you all the beer you want. The guy says, hmm, that sounds pretty good. So throughout this talk, I'm going to interject a little bit about what happened to those eight chilies that were evaluated, okay? I do that because it's right at lunch, and many of you will probably fall asleep, but maybe this will keep you awake. Now, the first chili is Mike's Matic Monster, Monster Chili, okay? So you see what the Judge 1 says, and this is with Judge 2. Now, Frank is the guy that we're probably interested in his assessment. Okay, so I want to start out with one, and then I'll move into the real presentation. You can read what he said, okay? I guess you can all see this. Okay, but I'll read the first one, because I won't read the rest. Holy crap, what the hell is this stuff? You could remove dried paint from your driveway with it. Took me two beers to put the flames out. Hope that's the worst one. These Texans are crazy. Okay, that was his first evaluation of the first show. Okay, now... Much of what we're going to talk about about drugs is summed up in sort of two words. One of them is called pharmacokinetics, and that's what, that's what the body does to a drug. And the other one is called pharmacodynamics, and that's what the drug does to the body. So when we talk about that, it's important for you at least to understand the basic principles of absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination of drugs because in the end most of you are going to be involved in evaluating a urine sample sometimes it could be hair sometimes it could be saliva sometimes it could be sweat but by and large it's usually urine but the body for the most part recognizes drugs as foreign and as we'll see that the liver is the one that primarily deals with metabolism that's why is that important that's important because many times you will find that there are other drugs present in the urine for which your, um, the individual you're talking to or representing had no ingestion of that drug at all, okay? Now, most of, most of, the, of the drugs that you deal with could be taken orally, but in the illicit drug screen, uh, you'll find individuals that will wind up doing inhalation or intravenous, as well as oral. And each of these routes gives a certain amount of bioavailability, which again reflects ultimately in how much that you will see or find in an individual's urine or blood or some other biological fluid. I put this in just because you'll see sometimes if you put it directly into the vein, the onset is immediately, immediate. And if you're dealing with individuals who abuse perhaps heroin or other drugs of abuse like uh, meth and, and cocaine, that might be essentially what they do when they graduate to being uh, a full-term uh, addicted individual. We're going to be talking about anti-mortem samples. I think most of your patients hopefully are still living. Uh, but in any event, what I, what I really want to do is to just let you recognize that most of us deal in situations where we're dealing with either whole blood 
Sometimes it's results that come from a hospital, and it could be serum or plasma. And for some of those drugs, it could be quite different, the ratio or the results coming from a plasma sample versus a whole blood sample. Most uh, frequently would be alcohol as a, as a, as a drug. So we're going to focus primarily on urine. Is that pretty much a safe assumption in here? For the most part, you're dealing with urine? Because DC, DCS, yes. I had the contract for, well, we still have the contract, but I, I generated that contract about uh, 14 years ago. But you could get these others if indeed somebody becomes um, incontinent or has shy bladder and can't, can't give a sample. So we're going to talk about it as it relates primarily to urine. Now, it's important that you understand about validation of samples because in this day and era, a lot of people think that there are a lot of ways to compromise a drug. And you can find people buying pure uh, virgin urine without drugs in it or whatever. This fancy, fancy apparatus now. I, my basic distinction in life was I went on TV because they had a new way of delivering uh, uh, drugs where they had a, a fake penis or a fake vagina. And so I got to answer all the questions. <coughs> the most important thing when they showed me this instrument was I was extremely envious more than <laughs> <laughs> But we deal with we deal with creatinine. Creatinine is, <coughs> pardon me, is the normal uh, breakdown product within the body. And it's a real good reflection of the quality of the urine sample. Usually it's equal to or greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter. If at the time that the sample is done, just like they're looking for certain drugs, it falls to less than 20 uh, mil uh, milligrams, then they'll go to what is a specific gravity. And a specific gravity normal is 1.003 or greater. And if that's the case, nothing happens. It's just accepted as a quote normal urine. If, it, if, uh, if it's less than that, then you'll start seeing things where they may talk about it being a dilute sample, or they may talk about it being an invalid sample. Many times individuals believe if they <coughs> pump themselves up with water, um, they'll flush out the, the drug. Well, ironically, many times they flush the drug out, but they concentrate the drug in the process of doing that. Uh, in the other case, when they try to go into the potty and essentially give a urine sample, they'll have little or no creatinine. And so therefore, it's very easy. Uh, when you're dealing with pH, people who sell products will tell you, well, if I increase the acidity of the drug or increase the alkalinity, uh, you won't get caught. Uh, well, that's not really true either, because we're looking for a certain pH range. If it's uh, less than 4 <laughs> or greater than 9, that's atypical. And there'll be another response within the report. Uh, in addition, uh, sometimes you can put nitrites which again have been taught, thought historically to confuse the, uh, the instrumentation. The problem is when you do that, you also confuse the controls and the standards. So it's like a blinking red light that something is wrong with the sample. Hence, you get a rejection because it's an invalid sample. <coughs> now, I think most of you know this, but I just want to make sure we're on the same wavelength. When, when a urine sample is taken for analysis, uh, in most jurisdictions, in most laboratories, they will usually do a screening test. It's important to understand that this screening test is essentially a qualitative. It's a test that's done very quickly. It's done very uh, sort of efficiently. It sort of gets you in the ballpark of whether or not the drug that you're interested in is there. Okay? If, again, if, if, if there's something in the blood or in the urine that even looks like that, Perhaps it will be a, a, a cross-reaction and it will indicate a positive. But that's a screening test. In the, and you need to understand, many places, many jurisdictions will take that easy way out and say, we found the presence of amphetamines. And that's all they say. They didn't do a confirmatory test because they think they're going to go to the person and the person's going to say, yeah, I fell off the wagon, I did this, that, and the other. But you can't use a screening test, in my judgment, in a court of law because you haven't confirmed the present. You always need to do the confirmation. The confirmation test uses a very sophisticated instrumentation, usually what's called GCMS, gas chromatography or mass spectrometry. Some, some laboratories use LCMS, which is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And essentially what that is, and I'll show you in just a, a minute, but 
It acts more like a fingerprint. The detector, as we'll see, breaks the uh, uh, drug apart, sort of puts it back together, and in doing so, you get sort of a fingerprint. So that's what you need to make sure in looking at results, is that indeed you're looking at confirmed results. Now, in the methods of analysis, there's a whole bunch of things that you could come across. In DCSFS, you don't, in one sense. You primarily are dealing with immunoassays and GCMS or LCMS. If you were dealing with certain uh, uh, county jurisdictions, you might be dealing with things like infrared or spectrophotometric assays. But we're going to talk primarily about immunoassays and GCMS. Okay, let me interrupt again. This is the number two chili. This is Arthur's afterburner chili. Why don't you take a look and see what Judge 1 and 2 said. Now, it's not on your handout, because I didn't want you to throw me out, because it has the handout as this information. We want to stick to the science, okay? But this is the second chili. Now, let's see what Frank said. Okay? Now you're beginning to see you're beginning to see the effect of dose. Some of these chilies have increased doses do amounts of certain things that are affecting Frank. Okay? We're all on the same wavelength? Okay. Alright. Now in these types of immunoassay, the ones that you will normally come in contact with is primarily the enzyme multiplied immunoassay assay technique referred to as emit. Because emit is an antigen antibody reaction. Whereas uh, in blood samples you may see ELISA or you may see RIA and you also can see some of the newer assays. But in general for what you deal with, I believe, in this contract, you will see the emit. And again, it's a, it's, it's a technique that's been devised essentially to to, to, to cause an interaction. Most of the drugs are not immunogenic, which means they don't have enough molecular weight to really interact um, uh, with an antibody. So, so somehow you've got to link it to something that, that still shows the qualities of the drug, but is big enough in molecular weight so it will cause an antigen-antibody reaction. Most drugs are coupled to a protein like uh, bovine serum albumin or something that makes it antigenic. That's the important part. That's part of the screening test. We're still only talking about the screening test. And again, what we do is the, where the site of coupling occurs, that is where the antigen and the antibody interact, gives you the specificity of the reaction. In the old days, they used to use what's called polyclonal antibodies, which meant that you can have a lot of cross-reactivity. Today, there with sophisticated techniques, they're going more to uh, po uh, monoclonal antibodies, which gives the specificity slightly better. Uh, so, in the case of the work that's done on the um, on the contract that you're dealing with, they're using antibodies that's a, that's more monoclonal than polyclonal. But even then, there's still the ability to cross-react and have interacting have false positives. You need to be aware of that. Now, this represents the confirmatory test. This is just my little graphic representation. But once the urine is extracted, meaning it has all the drugs of interest in for that particular class or in the sample, it's essentially either uh, derivatized or it's directed inject directly into a gas chromatograph, which has an oven. Chromatography essentially separates complex mixtures into individual components. That's important. So that when this thing ultimately is seen by the detector, what the detector done is this, does is essentially it bombards it with a stream of electrons and the, and the drug of interest fractionates into ions. These ions fragments are then reformed in the instrument, hence you get the, you get the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, gold standard, if you will, of fingerprint. And, and based on when it's seen by the detector, the, the database will indicate exactly what they saw, so that you get the, it can come, it can separate things very close in structure, but it can tell whether meth or amp or phenylphenoxamine or propanolamine or Sudafed or whatever is present. 
That's what a confirmation test does. The screening test does not do that. Okay? Okay. Now, I believe this comes close to what you have to deal with in your uh, panel. Uh, many of these drugs are illicit. Illicit essentially in its use, but many of them really are prescription drugs that have been found to be used because they give some sort of um, brief uh, alteration of consciousness, which evidently the individuals choose to try. So I'm going to try to cover these all in the time that we have. Now, if any of you have any questions about a specific class as we go through, I certainly don't mind taking the question. Uh, but we're going to try to cover these, some of which uh, are very, very straightforward. Others are a little bit more complex. Okay. This is number three. Uh, this is uh, actually Fred's famous burn down the barn chili. Okay? Can you take a moment, just 10 seconds, to read it so you understand what the judges are looking for? That's important. Now, if you can't see this, I'll keep you afterwards and you can get a hold of it. <laughs> Frank says, <laughs> call the EPA. <laughs> <laughs> he's drinking so much beer that he's getting okay. Okay. <laughs> but now again, you have to understand this is only chili number three. The dose has increased a little more in Frank's mind. Okay. Now let's talk about amphetamines. Amphetamines are dear to my heart, actually. <laughs> and the reason is, is my doctoral thesis was on the pharmacological management of acute amphetamine. <laughs> And it was generated when I was a captain in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War, in which three, um, three Army guys died of acute ingestion. And eight hours <laughs> later, at the time of their autopsy, their rectal temperatures were 108 degrees. Okay, I just want you to understand, 108 degrees. And the reason is that is because uh, amphetamines are stimulants and they cause a lot of somatomotor activation, which means you generate a lot of heat. And if the body can't dissipate that heat, then your core body temperature goes up. And if it goes up too high without any intervention, you literally fry. Okay? Now, most people who take this drug don't necessarily get that dose, but you always hear situations where uh, a person addicted did die, and what happens is either the purity of the drug or the amount that they took got increased. Okay. But essentially, there are two legitimate uses for uh, methamphetamine in this point in time. One is for the treatment of narcolepsy, which is a sleep disorder. Some of you may have that before this lecture is over. <laughs> the second one is that the adult onset of ADHD. So you can have a, a, a pill or a capsule that has 10 to 15 milligrams of methamphetamine in it and be perfectly uh, legitimate as a, as a prescription. Okay. Uh, essentially, most people take it because they want to get the euphoric effects, and many of you know most of those effects, but it's a sense of, uh, you, you, there's lost inhibitions, there's excitement, there's, that you, you become wide awake and alert or whatever. All that's fine for a few minutes, but then over time, you get all the bad effects, and if you keep taking it, it's very, very addictive. Yes, ma'am. You just said that there are two legitimate uses for methamphetamine. This says amphetamines are... Well, okay. Amphetamines is the class of compounds. Amphetamine itself, D-amphetamine, uh, is also called Adderall or Adderall, okay? It's, it's amphetamine salts. It's primarily, for the most part, used in children or, uh, or juveniles, uh, but it can be taken. And, and there's this going to be a very important point to make from that. Because if you, if you look at the different kinds of drugs that have either amphetamine or methamphetamine in it, uh, you will find that um, in addition to, to just pure methamphetamine and amphetamine, there is a drug called selegiline. Selegiline is a drug that's used uh, for Parkinson's syndrome. And when, the, when you take it, it breaks down. And one of the byproducts of that uh, metabolism is methamphetamine. One yes. more time, just repeat it. So what you're saying is amphetamines is the general... That's, that's the class. That's the class. And so d-amphetamine, methamphetamine, all of these are 
part of that class. So methamphetamine would be part of the class. Yes, and essentially, chemically, it's called phen phenethylamine. It's the phenethylamine concept. What could give you a positive in this in a screening test? Sudafed, <coughs> over-the-counter cough medications, any kind of antihistamines that you would take. Those can all give you false positives, okay? So the class is amphetamine. What's really important about methamphetamine use, and, and I think I'll demonstrate it in a minute, but just while I have it on my mind, methamphetamine metabolizes to amphetamine, okay? That's important. You get nothing else, obviously that's important. What's really important is amphetamine never metabolizes to methamphetamine. So if you've got somebody that's taken prescription for Adderall, they're never going to have or should not have methamphetamine in that urine sample. Comprende? I mean, it's a one-way street. Okay. Again, I just put these here because a lot of times the, the, the stimulus for either a decision to, to, to test for the drug is based on some sort of uh, a problem. And when you do see the, the plus sides of alertness and excitation, there's euphoria. There, for many people who, who take it all the time, supposedly their inhibitions are reduced and they look at it sort of as a sexual stimulant as well. And all of the common things that you see here, but the, below that, really are not what's considered the reason why they take it. It's the side effects because you'll have both cognition and uh, physical responses. So it's not uncommon to see individuals who are sweating, who in a cool night or whatever. Sometimes they have bruxism, which is a grinding of the teeth. There's a whole cascade of symptoms that they can have uh, when, when they're being looked at. But that's basically the kinds of things. And if you get bad enough where you're really hooked on the drug, this is where your loss of inhibitions, conscious uh, violence, aggressiveness, and this is where it's lights out that the okay corral and I just have a case in Riverside where I have five dead bodies based on an interaction to reestablish a drug plan among some gangs and somebody tilted something and, as I said, all hell went loose and we had five dead bodies to look at. Now, with amphetamines, again, you could take them orally. That's really not illicitly why they would do it. And the reason is it takes 30 to 45 minutes to even digest within the stomach and the small intestine. So you feel the effects, but the delay in onset is very significant. Inhalation is very, basically very fast. Once you put a, a, a source of heat under that material, uh, crystal meth, and then you volatilize it and you inhale it, probably within a minute to two minutes, you'll start getting demonstrable levels in the bloodstream. And so it's very fast. Uh, you can snort it, which is the intranasal kind of thing. It goes into the nasal membranes, gets into the system a little bit like cocaine does, and as I said, you can inject it. In one sense, understanding the route of administration helps you understand what actually is going on. Now, you may not get to that level with your client, but that's the, that's the way in which it goes. Um, and there are different types of users depending upon whether the weekend warrior, you know, the first case I ever had, a, a young lady had just gotten married and her in-laws were coming for the first time and her house looked like a wreck. So she takes meth, so she stays up all night long cleaning up the place when her, for her uh, relatives to come to. That's sort of a, or you hear about the truck driver, right? The guy gets in his truck and he drives 500 miles. Not a good scene. And in the federal system, you will get your license revoked. But my, my point is, once you see somebody start taking it routinely, literally somebody has given it to them free to get them hooked. From there on, you don't want to undergo the withdrawal, so you constantly try to reinforce the system. Hence the term meth freak and other things, where that individual is only interested in his or her next fix. These are the patterns of use, as I said. Sometimes, in that case, it's usually just oral. <coughs> People are just taking it. They want to get the stimulatory effects. They don't really see the euphoric. And there's no real psychological addiction to that pattern. The binge user essentially starts <laughs> at the point where the, he or she is either insufflation with snorting or, or primarily smoking it. And there you do experience this euphoric rush, which, for, which lasts for um, six to ten minutes, depending upon the dose. The sy symptoms may last for a couple of hours, and these individuals will ultimately become psychologically addicted to the drug. 
Uh, we see a lot of these, and I just put this for the high intensity. Those people basically are at a point where they need to get it fast and as often as they can, um, and so they, they, they inject it. In general, there's a difference in the way methamphetamine users use their drug and cocaine users use their drug. Methamphetamine users almost use it like a prescription. They take it multiple times a day because they know just about when it's going to start to come down and then go back up. Cocaine, for some reason, studies have shown that individuals will essentially snort or use the cocaine, all of which they have, get a full blown, and then uh, sort of sort of collapse until they can get up and go find some more, that sort of thing. It's a little bit different rondo. Not always the same, but the vast majority of people use it that way. Again, when you're looking at amphetamines, I just wanted to make sure that you understood, because typically if you get a result back that's been confirmed, 7 to 10 percent of that methamphetamine uh, uh, use has been converted to amphetamine. And amphetamine is an active drug. That's another important thing to understand. You don't get in criminal defense cases so much, but I deal a lot with public defenders and they need to understand that. That's just a little piece of uh, useful information. But uh, what happens is it then goes from methamphetamine to amphetamine and down to some other drugs, which can still cross-react with the antibody, even though there may be little or no methamphetamine present at the time. Um, so this is the route uh, that you see of elimination. The half-life for amphetamines is pretty much dependent upon the pH, because methamphetamine is a basic drug. So anything you can do to make it more water-soluble, if, if you add a urinary acidifier, it will eliminate sort of faster. So generally, uh, methamphetamine, the average half-life, which is the time it takes to reduce the, pres the amount by 50%, is usually around 10 hours with a range of 6 to 15. <coughs> Amphetamines itself can be a little a longer. I don't know if you deal with ecstasy at all, but MDMA is another variation. It is a stimulant, but it doesn't have it as potent a stimulatory effect as does methamphetamine, but its, it's value is it's considered to be a, a date rate drug because there's a little bit of an amnestic response in terms of recalling things if one gets high on ecstasy. When they excrete it, as I said, the pretty much most of the drug from methamphetamine is eliminated in the urine with, I think this actually, I've changed this uh, over time, I think it's pretty much 7 to 10 percent now as amphetamine, its major active metabolite. So if you're dealing with individuals that do have a legitimate reason for having an amphetamine, it's really critical to know, are we really only dealing with Adder you know, the Adderall and the amphetamine itself, or whether there's something else that's going on. Any questions again about meth? I have one. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to go back to this, but on the prescription drugs, Yes, ma'am. which of the prescription drugs make you test positive for the methamphetamine? Um, all of them will give you a, a, a positive screening amphetamine. The only ones that are going to give you a confirmatory test for methamphetamine is methamphetamine, selegiline, and there are a couple of drugs in, that come out of Mexico that are variations of methamphetamine. The others, when you do the chromatography, they won't separate into methamphetamine. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, do they build up a high tolerance? Do you have to keep increasing the amount that you use each time? Yeah, the question came up about tolerance. Tolerance is, a, in a simple way of saying, it takes more of the drug to give you the same effect. So most of these illicit drugs, yes, you start, the, 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 uh, the physiological problems of an elevated pulse and an elevated heart rate, and you're, that, that all stays, that doesn't really matter. But things trying to get the euphoria, or trying to get back to that, that sort of um, trying to get back to the land that you really want to get to, it takes more and more. And as you build up tolerance, you can become somewhat resistant. If you, and that's the reason you see a lot of people dying, because individuals who are not very much used to methamphetamine will get a highly pure form. Because in the way this has worked, everybody wants to get their cut of the money stream. So it starts out at 90-something percent pure, and then they start cutting it in half and half and half and half. And down by the time it gets to the street use, you're probably looking at maybe 15% purity. All of a sudden, somebody gets a 70% shot, and he or she goes and meets their maker because that isn't going to work. I mean, you literally, as I said, will die. Yes? What are they cutting with? 
What are they what? Discrete level? Oh. What they typically cover? Uh, any kind, well, any kind of, uh, they, they can cut it with sucrose, they can cut it with lactose, they can cut it with, um, um, there's a couple of starch-related things that look like it. it. Just it's not really uniform. I mean, the, the, the manufacturing can be very, very sophisticated, but but in general, the average person is not going to know. And if you did a if you did a color test uh, to see whether or not it reacted, there'll always be enough to give you the color test so the guy doesn't get really pissed off. Okay. Yes, ma'am. How long will the macro, the or the seeing system, is that such that it will show up on a drug screen? Okay. Good question. Again, as a toxicologist, I would tell you it's related to the. Thank you. Okay. But the reality is, most individuals who use meth will probably find it. You can find it in their urine probably for four to five days after they stop. Again, it's dose dependent. But that's the case. We'll see other drugs that take a lot longer, and we'll explain why that's the case. Okay. So again, just in summary, we're going to do a screening test. It's probably going to be an immunoassay test, like emit. They're going to find out that in this run of samples, there's two, four, six, and eight are screen positive. They're going to take those numbers, they're going to go back, and they're going to get another aliquot of the urine sample from the original container. And then they're going to do an extraction that takes these basic drugs out of solution, and then they're going to inject it on a GCMS, and they're going to look for the chromatogram to see if it matches up with methamphetamine or whatever. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you'll see Sudafed or something. And what will happen is that drug will be screen positive, but it'll be uh, confirmed negative, and the result will go out negative. Okay? That's the way that works. Or it should. I'm trying to get a little bit broader because some of you in some point in time is going to be dealing with another sort of laboratory or entity, and you may see a little bit difference in how it's structured. With, with the DCFS, they wanted to make sure they got as much information. And as you know, probably a few years ago, you were tested once a week, randomly. Now, I guess it's twice a month or something. Or, you know, and obviously good, good people who know this drill pretty much know when they're going to get tested, which is another interesting science. Okay, let's go to, not quite my favorite, because I don't have any personal experience with this one, but this is cocaine. Okay? It comes, as you know, from a, from a, a plant. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing in that could you find a person that actually was positive for cocaine and not using it? You could. If somebody had nose and throat surgery relatively recently and then had a urine sample taken, you will find coke, uh, either coke, parent cocaine or we'll see as its metabolite, which is called benzoylegonine, which is what I call BE, okay? But it is uh, available on a prescription sometimes, but it's, it's abused as a stimulant. And again, if it's, if it's the cocaine hydrochloride is primarily water soluble and you use it for injection. If it's free base, where you convert it back to, uh, to crack cocaine, then it's primarily useful because putting a source of heat under it will cause it to volatilize, hence you can smoke it and, uh, and, uh, and you can also use, uh, use it as the, uh, as the snorting. This is a group of uh, materials that I had a chance to photograph, but there, but and, and it's important to understand. There's new legislation. I don't know if you saw that, but yeah. but now they finally woke up. And I mean, you know, most of my experience is not always, but a lot of times it's good people doing stupid things, right? I mean, you've had, you've all had somebody like that. Well, if you get caught with crack above a certain weight, you are burned you will, as far as the sentencing guidelines, because many times they want to know, is it the, is it the hydrochloride or the free base? Well, the reality is the stimulatory effects and the abuse potential are still the same. I understand, I don't know exact, but I think the, I think the government is now making a change so that both uh, crack and ACL are the same, because there's a dramatic difference in the sentencing guidelines with crack I mean, than, than there is with the hydrochloride. Okay, so much for that. Again, it's got a relatively short half-life, which is one of the reasons why most people, many people use meth. It's because it's cheaper, it lasts longer, and the stimulatory effects are, are, are more pronounced. The problem with, um, with cocaine is our body has a very unique system with the liver to metabolize. And this little baby 
gets, um, once first passed through the liver, the liver starts chopping it and, uh, and, and hydrolyzes it to a drug called benzoyl agonine. Benzoyl agonine is totally inactive. You and I could snort a pound of it all day long, and we're not going to get any effects other than you may gag or you know, whatever you're doing, but it, it's not going to happen. So you can see when you do either insufflation or an injection, the, the, the time interval may change somewhat. But uh, the interesting part about this from our point of view is that this is the only, one of the only drugs I know that you can take a urine sample and analyze it 10 minutes after it was analyzed and maybe see parent cocaine and BE. If you wait three weeks or a month, take the same thing out of the refrigerator and do it, you're going to see less cocaine and more BE because it spontaneously hydrolyzes in the body. Now, I don't know if that's a little pearl, but sometimes if one, a if one agency finds A, meaning cocaine and something, and you get it retested and you find B, it could be that relationship, but sometimes certain judges and PAs, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. And so that may, you, you might be able to at least consider, is that, is that plausible, recognizing why that would be the case? Yes, ma'am. And that's regardless of whether it's freebase or it's in the powder form. It's the same process. Cocaine is essentially the same once it gets into you. It's, it's the rapidity with which it gets into your, your system, okay? And, uh, and, the, and obviously the point I would make also, if you only found BE, the one thing that you do know, the only way you get BE is if you use cocaine, okay? You can't get it from Krispy Kreme donuts, all these other things that I've had been asked before, or your high blood pressure or your tranquilizers, the way it doesn't work. That's, that's what the liver does. It, it, it hydrolyzes it, okay? Cocaine is active. This is another important thing that I want to mention is this drug called copaethylene. You may see it sometimes in a report. Probably on DCFS, you may not. But cocaethylene is only formed, only formed, when you have the concomitant ingestion of alcohol and cocaine. This is one of the few drugs that actually gets prepared inside the body. And it's, it has an equal potent stimulation to the parent cocaine. But you'll only find, you, you could not have this form if there were no alcohol present. And sometimes you see that in results all the time if it gets done someplace or you with them. It does not mean that the person used coca ethylene. Okay? Okay, oh, now I'm on number four, I think. This is Bubba's Black Magic. This is pretty tough. You might want to read that. Have I got a chance? <laughs> <laughs> now, again, at this point, he's starting to really experience the adverse effects, and his cognition is sort of gone. I mean, he's, he's dealing on with his vital signs, so the dose is really sort of raised quite a bit. Okay, another interesting drug is cannabis. I know. I know you as attorneys are not familiar with this drug, but I'll try to get you up to speed really fast. Okay? This is one of my home plants that I know. <laughs> Just kidding, a little humor. No, no, no. But cannabis sativa, I was a pharmacist before I was a toxicologist. I didn't think, I took a drug, a course called pharmacognosy, which is the study of plants. We affectionately referred to it as weeds and seeds. Okay? But I never thought I'd use anything for my pharmacy. When I got into the military, and they sent me to William Beaumont General Hospital, which I never knew where it was, except Marty Robbins used to sing out in the West Texas town of El Paso. I went to, I went to El Paso to protect us from any Viet Cong that came up through the <laughs> And I'm here to tell you, not one did. So you, many of you weren't born then, but for the ones of you who were born, you have me to thank. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So, but we did learn everything about how to identify uh, uh, weed and, and what, it has some very distinct properties, but in any event, cannabis is from the plant cannabis sativa. It's, it's a, it is a plant. The active ingredient, what you need to know, cannabis has probably a hundred different uh, cytosterols in it, but the main, uh, the main psychoactive component is this delta-9 THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, okay? And you can find marijuana 
you know, most people smoke it. That's clearly 95%. But when you deal with your groups, sometimes I've had situations where people have bought cookies down in Venice and other than three places, or they have a medical marijuana card, which really doesn't mean jack. Uh, and unfortunately, they give cookies, and then the little four-year-old takes the cookie, eats the cookie, and she feels nothing uh, particularly wrong with her either. But if you took a urine sample from that individual, it would, it would, it would be positive for, for THC or for the uh, carboxy THC. So this is the way you, this is the area, this is, the, Marinol is the pill form you take. The reason you do the, the smoking, as you probably can uh, realize, is you get a much more rapid inf influx of the drug into the circulatory system and the, and the, and the psychoactive drug acting on the brain is really can be detected in probably 60 to uh, 90 seconds after it's been inhaled. Whereas if you took a Marinol cookie or you ate the brownies, it takes over an hour to start getting any sort of demonstrable effect. And lest I sound too uh, flippant here, there is legitimate, there are a couple of legitimate reasons why individuals would use marijuana. I mean, in nausea of medication with cancer patients and a variety of things. But many people will simply go into a doctor and the doctor says, I see no reason why you can't use uh, marijuana. So he walks out with this mar medical marijuana card thinking, man, my life is complete. And the, and the arresting officer could really care less, okay? So, for, for whatever it's worth. You can, the, the, the THC can usually be in, found in these cigarettes, can be up to 12%. Although I have to tell you, over time, the quality of the marijuana plant is improving all the time. When I was at the University of Mississippi getting my undergraduate, we had a federal contract from the, with the governor. We were the only state, and still is, the only state where you actually can you plant marijuana in order to be used for controls and standards all across the country. So the point is, you know, selective growing increases the rate of the THC. So typically you're getting about 5 to 20 milligrams of the, of the material because you don't know how much of the amount that's, that, that you're uh, smoking actually gets into the deep alveolar spaces, so you lose a lot. So a lot of people say, well, what does that level mean with regard to how much the individual use? That's a very hard question because there's so many variables. But what you can do, again, is know what you will expect. The liver, again, is very, very efficient. What you need to know, and probably what you do know, in a urine sample, finding positive for Carboxy THC means that that individual could have, could have, that, that marijuana could be in their system for literally several days, several weeks, or in some cases as long as a month. And the rationale behind that is because THC, when it's converted to carboxy THC, is water, <coughs> is both water soluble but it's fat soluble. Now, lest I get run out of here by all you women, I do want to make a statement, and I don't take it out of context, but because women have a little bit more fat content than men, which I've never been able to really quantitate from most of the men I see, uh, you could have a, a more of the THC, carboxy THC, in your fat cells, hence they'll re-equilibrate over time. So if a, but if a person's a weekend warrior, he or she is not going to have a positive marijuana test for three weeks. That doesn't happen. I mean, if you're a chronic user, usually your carboxy THC levels are in triple digits, usually well over 300 nanograms, and that could mean somebody that's a chronic user, okay? And you might see that. Again, it does mean that at some point in time, your client used marijuana. You don't get carboxy THC unless you do that. But as far as taking that sample and saying, well, my individual was under the influence two hours earlier, Unless you have some very compelling symptomology that would suggest that, all that means is marijuana was used. Okay? We all in agreement there? It was just simply used. Okay. Could I ask yes, you a question? If people are now beginning to understand about secondhand smoke and its carcinogenic effect, what about when the clients say, I didn't use, but I was at a party and someone was standing right next to me. What? How, what, how does that affect? You, wouldn't, you are the, one of the nicest straight ladies that I've ever met. I'm not my straight. Next <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, no, okay. my wife always tells me my humor is not necessarily... <laughs> but what I mean to say is, let me show you what I mean. Here. So, you know, <laughs> Okay, well again, because when you're 
dealing with smoking marijuana, honestly, you can begin to see the effect. They say 10 seconds. I, I, I did see. I would give it more like 20, but it doesn't really matter. But the point is, you reach, marijuana has one of these very steep rises and very steep falls. Now, I have a case right now where an individual is in starting trial today in which the amount of uh, delta 9 THC is 1.5 nanograms. The problem with that making that, that occur just at the time of this driving incident is that what happens is it goes very high up, very high down, but the half-life of THC is very long, several days. And that is simply to say that it hovers around one to two nanograms in the bloodstream for several days. So if you find it at that level, it doesn't mean that the person really used it just just right away. If you start getting to 7 to 10 nanograms or 100 nanograms, there is a correlation. Okay, so that's what it really means. So, but usually the, the rule of thumb that I have, except any word you, is that usually by four hours, most all of the symptoms associated with the use of the marijuana are gone by four hours. And that's probably 95% of the people. So, so if somebody said they did it yesterday, they could still have a positive THC, carboxy THC in their urine. But uh, again, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, from a recent use. Okay, again, we use the same kind of immunoassay. Now, we're talking about polyclonal antibodies. It may be difficult for, for that. that. That's pretty, pretty sophisticated. Some, some labs will do what's called a color test or a microscopic test if they actually found plant materials in the compartment. And it's called the nucleolidine test and the microchrysalum test. But again, to confirm it, you've got to go to GC mass spec. And, ah, now, we did a, when I was at the Medical College of Virginia, we did a little study with this idea of passive inhalation, because we get that all the time. The real truth of the matter is, yes, you can get a demonstrable level of, uh, of uh, THC in your urine from passive inhalation, but it's usually down at the 5 to 7 nanograms in a urine sample, okay? And that requires you to be put in a 4 by 8 room with marijuana smoke coming in and you stay in there for about eight hours. <laughs> Just so you understand. I'm not suggesting that you don't take your, your, your client's word, but it ain't going to go too far. Okay? Because it can occur, but, it is, but the level sort of gives you away. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do the levels, do the THC levels go down continuously, or can they... Can they go up and down without a person using them? The, no, there, there is a little, there is some, a, a little bit of dynamics, but in general, when you cessate, your body is metabolizing it faster than anything. But your point is well taken. You, it can go dramatically up and then come down, and if you choose to take another hit off the bong or whatever, it's oh, going to yeah. go right back up. Okay, it's not going to all go down. Yes, ma'am. Um, what about hemp products and lotions? Can that cause any positive? Um. Uh, 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 topical adsorption really um, has not been shown to be a problem. Hemp, you can get it, but I don't eat rope, so I don't think that's really <laughs> a really useful source. Question. Yes, sir. But if you ingest marijuana today in the test, the, the level is going to be high. Next week, I would assume the level will still be there, but will be low. Yes. And a week from then, I assume it could be there and it would be even lower. Without any intervention, uh, yes, it, you, your body is converting it, it because the urine is an ultrafiltrate ultra of the blood, and as that equilibrium goes, that, that reform, uh, that eliminated in the blood is going to be picked up by the urine. <laughs> the CFS is going to test, and they test again randomly two weeks from now, we're still going to find most likely marijuana in the system. You mean of that same person? Yes. Well, that would only be true in my judgment is if you've got a if you've got a real uh, consistent frequent user. I mean, you can't that, that that month that three weeks to a month doesn't occur with an individual who uses it on the weekend. If we have a baby who tests positive at birth, we're saying that's not good enough. If a mother tested negative, what do we think? Uh, well, if it's confirmed by GC mass spec, it's a matter of uh, you, the, the mother the mother. Uh, the liver system in the mother is uh, is a lot is allowing it to be eliminated. Where the child, the uh, the uh, metabolic uh, disposition of the liver is not is not as, as, as advanced. 
Oh, so it is possible. Oh, yeah, I, I have cases like that quite a bit. Uh, and what about the other way around? <laughs> 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 what about the other way around? You mean the other way around, meaning the, the, the baby's nothing perfect and the mother's positive? Yeah, oh, that happens too. But would the baby necessarily have any effects? Well, if the baby doesn't have a, a, a level circulating, the baby wouldn't. It wouldn't be jittery, agitated, or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics that go on. Uh, I realize my, my, my presentation is getting bad. I see a lot of things. <laughs> okay, you're going to miss Frank's number five. This may be one of the best ones, actually. Frank now is basically having a real problem. And, and the bottom line, his lips were turned off. Again, it's dose-related, okay? You, you can read it. Okay, I'll try, to, I'll try to cut through these others. i got two minutes or so. Okay, uh, as you're moving out the door, I just want to tell you, cyclidine or PCP is a bad news drug. <laughs> any circumstances, it's a bad news drug. Could you, excuse me, before you get into this, uh, how much, in the normal course, how much more would you have in time? Because if you've got enough for another hour, we can have you come back. Well, okay, I... I, I Rather than you feel... Yeah. That's, that's yeah. fair, and the other thing I would say is I, I also... Mm -hmm. As my encore, because I thought I was going to get a standing ovation, I did have alcohol <laughs> discussion as well. So if it's if it's appropriate that everybody's got to get back to work, then I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be more than court. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah. 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 Is that okay? Uh, it's fine. Great. We stop right here so you don't get into one subject, and then they yeah. have you come back. Uh, yeah, I, I will leave myself three hours to get here from Westlake. <laughs> <laughs> I saw. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much.